I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Good day. My name is uh, Rick Shearing. I'm one of the NASA flight surgeons at Johnson Space Center. And today I'm talking about uh, our medical operations project that we did during the Apollo missions. So as far as the introduction, just to give you a background, uh, back in 2005, we were uh, really on the cusp of starting the Constellation program. And my manager at NASA, uh, J.D. Polk, had asked me to go back and study the, the Apollo missions particularly looking at uh, health and performance and things that we could do better the next time around uh, for the return lunar mission. So the main objective was to look at problems that occurred during those missions that were particularly relevant to medical operations. Uh, we wanted to validate and refresh our systems knowledge to make sure when we were writing requirements for the vehicle, for the life support systems, for the surface operations, you name it, that uh, we didn't make mistakes. Again, most of us who were working this uh, return lunar in 2005 were four or five years old back when the Apollo astronauts did this. So we need to really understand what the mission was about. Uh, we wanted to definitely take the knowledge that we learned from Apollo and apply this to other environments, not only moon, but uh, looking down the road to potentially Mars or other worlds. Um, it was important to point out, for those of you who are familiar with the biomedical results of Apollo, that this was not a review of that data. That was a very comprehensive review of all the medical data that was accumulated during Apollo, but this was not that. The radar could go and read biomedical results. This was more from an operational standpoint. If you're the flight surgeon handling this mission, if you're understanding what's going on with the vehicle, the entire mission, what was that background like? And that's really the insight and that was the impetus to really do this project. As far as our methods, took all available resources uh, to look into the Apollo medical operations, including first and foremost, the Apollo medical mission debriefs. So I spent months reviewing the debriefs, learning everything I could from the interviews that the uh, Apollo flight students had with their crews about every aspect of the pre, in, and post-flight mission phases. I looked over every one of the Apollo flight surgeon logs from each one of the uh, Apollo missions, starting with Apollo 7, and then reviewed the Apollo biomedical engineer logs. The mission commentaries in particular are very interesting because that was kind of a look back at what happened during the mission, including all the science, along with the mission reports. There was also a program summary report, which really was about a 650-page, you know, very thick book about what actually went on as far as the entire program, science, everything involved, just to give a little bit of background. One of the more useful resources I used was the Apollo Lunar Surface Journals, which is available online. A fantastic resource of photos, videos, the science, compendiums of all kinds of information. Use that as a point of reference. Tie that into the preliminary science reports, again, to get backgrounds in science. And then at the time, Dr. Joe Kerwin, who was a Skylab astronaut, he was a physician at Ast uh, NASA, he was a Navy flight surgeon, uh, had a monthly series called the Apollo, Apollo Lecture Series. And you could go and our, go back into the archives and look at these, these um, interviews that they would have for icons uh, from Apollo, uh, the astronauts. Remember, uh, Alan Bean gave a, just a great lecture about uh, Apollo 12 or John Aaron, or Aaron Rose, or any number of people you could see in the lecture series that, that were a fantastic resource. And then last but not least were the personal communications. If there was something in my background research that wasn't clear, or I needed clarification on something, or I generated additional questions in my flight surgeon role, because I would see the Apollo astronauts in the flight medicine clinic at Johnson, I could just go and talk to them or email them. And that later on became a very useful way of following up on things or discussing problems that would come along during Constellation to actually just send an email and say, hey, gentlemen, we got this problem and uh, can you give me some feedback? And the Apollo astronauts were really helpful and enthusiastic about supporting us um, uh, during that effort. <laughs> 
One thing I asterisked here at the bottom was that the crew logs, the uh, crew questionnaires, and air-to-ground transmissions were not available. Those are things that currently in mission control I use uh, from a, a mission standpoint today. Uh, I did go back and try to look at that to clarify different things, but uh, most of those were a loss of time, unfortunately. So, how did we organize this? Well, we started off with uh, Apollo 7 and went on through Apollo 17 and broke them down into categories based on all the research and what were the most common uh, themes along each mission, first and foremost starting with the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, EMU, uh, suit, the space suit, going on into lunar surface operations, the in-flight illnesses, the kits that the crews used that had all their medications, all their instrumentation, the vehicle itself, what was the environment like with regards to carbon dioxide, oxygen, pressure, temperature, etc.? Uh, what was the radiation uh, environment like and what were their workarounds in the event that there was a radiation event, like a solar particle event? What did the, exercise, what did the astronauts do for exercise? Uh, what was their food nutrition like? And then other things, specifically psychological aspects, uh, the performance and health and uh, human factors. Uh, particularly paying attention to the crew's schedule, which was a theme that came out over and over again, that the crews uh, typically launched tired and uh, were worked pretty hard in very dynamic phases of the mission, and then it was followed by um, sheer boredom during the translunar or trans-Earth coasts. Uh, the launch, entry, and recovery operations, and then flight surgeon crew interactions. As far as the results of our, our work, uh, we developed uh, basically 236 pages of responses to almost 300 questions that I developed for our face-to-face -face meeting, and over time, we had uh, over 80% participation of the surviving Apollo astronauts. Eight of them were able to attend the, the three-day face-to-face meeting, and then a follow-on extra 10 participated in either phone conversations, uh, over personal interviews, face-to-face, -face, uh, on the phone or online or via email, and uh, that's really how we uh, put all these results together. This chart's really kind of busy, but take time to actually look at how we broke down each of those categories, the number of questions, the responses. The most important thing from an engineering standpoint are the recommendations. What did the uh, Apollo astronauts recommend to the future designers, the future flight surgeons, engineers, as far as things that they would recommend we put into requirement development for improving crew health and performance uh, for the missions? The following slides are going to kind of run down just at a high level some of the real highlights of each one of those categories and the responses. As far as the first category, the uh, EVA, EMU, the recommendation primarily centered around improving the glove flexibility, dexterity, and fit. This is a picture of Captain John Young, the Apollo 16 commander, using one of our current gloves and then compared it to the A7LB glove that he used on Apollo 16. And it was overwhelmingly uh, clear that uh, the, uh, the old Apollo gloves just really lacked the dexterity in the hand. But they all pretty much unanimously recommended that we improve the dexterity because it was really hard to, to manipulate objects, to do different things in this glove. Uh, they described it as a squeezing a tennis ball both ways for four or five or six hours. So that was really key. Put your money in improving glo glove dexterity. Uh, when Captain Young and the other astronauts actually got their hands in the current gloves that we use for spacewalks, they said that this was a, a market improvement over what he remembered from uh, Apollo. They recommend that you reduce the mass of the suit by a couple factors um, that would actually play into the fatigue that they would describe. Even in the 1.6G environment, getting around in the suit pressurized at 3.75 psi uh, was, uh, was tiresome. Uh, in large part because of what was going on in the hand and the form and the wrist, but also in the lower extremities. That suit didn't have a waist ring, so you'll see in subsequent uh, slides how they actually um, got around the surface by kind of kangaroo hopping. Um, so they really recommended that we try to increase the general mobility of that suit by a couple of factors. They were adamant in that that lunar boot that we used uh, actually worked really well. They didn't have any concerns that they would twist their ankles, that there would be any issues with any uh, lower extremity injuries and felt, you know, whatever you did with that boot, with the exception of maybe having something that would grip uh, rocky surfaces better because they said that the, the rocks had a lot of uh, silica glass in it and you could slip on the rocks. But the lunar dirt itself had a very high coefficient of friction. This actually kind of grabbed their feet and they didn't slip or slide very much at all. 
Uh, they felt that glove liners should definitely be worn uh, to intervene between the hands and the glove itself just to prevent abrasions and other injuries to the skin, uh, something that we use today in all our spacewalks, but back then they had the option of using them or not. Um, they also felt that the helmet restricted their range of motion, and if you had a helmet that more closely matched like a a Navy uh, deep diving uh, uh, helmet that you had more like three, uh, about 180 degree visibility that, that would really help. One of the big issues they had with the lunar surface operations was the dust. The dust got into everything. It was not anticipated to be as much of a factor as it had been, uh, but if the crews got the dust in their, their nose and their eyes, other areas of the skin, it was really, really irritating. It can cause runny eyes, nasal congestion, uh, runny nose, uh, coughing. Uh, the symptoms varied astronaut to astronaut, but it was something that they, they recommended you definitely try to engineer out. And one of the, the, the outcomes of that was that an airlock that the crew could actually ingress into, get out of their suit once the free dust was kind of um, gotten rid of, and then seal that hatch once you went in the habitable volume would be a great way to prevent the crews from getting contact, direct contact with the dust. As far as navigation, uneven surfaces, one thing that's important to know about the moon, I didn't know this, but uh, they said that the moon was had a very undulating surface. It was uh, more like an ocean with swells than a desert. One of the concerns there was, getting back to the limitations in the suit mobility, that um, it was very difficult to try to go up and down a, a sloped terrain uh, you know, in the suit configuration they had. They would try to sidestep to get in or out, but certainly recommended that anything more than about 26 degrees slope would really pose a problem for the crew to get out of. Um, as far as the um, schedule of getting out of the uh, vehicle once they landed, they felt that surface activities really could begin once operationally feasible. Uh, in other words, you know, once they safe the vehicle, had an opportunity to have some nutrition, uh, rest, maybe review their, their procedures, that they could actually get out on the lunar surface. There was no real distinct period of time that they had to kind of readapt to a gravitational environment. Now, that was a really interesting comment because when my crew comes back from the International Space Station, granted, they've been gone in space for six months, uh, my crews have to be carried out of the Soyuz, have to be carried on a lawn chair, have to be provided for because they just lack a lot of the, the neurovestibular and balance functions. On the moon, they said that they didn't really recognize that as a problem, so you didn't have to wait to adapt to 1.6G. Uh, but a lot of it, again, had to probably do with the short transit and the fact that the 1.6G did not really um, task or um, um, challenge their neurovestibular, their balance systems, as much as it would when they came back to 1G environment on the Earth. As far as the rover, they felt that one very useful thing for rover to allow them to stay out on the surface longer would to be actually have an ability to recharge the consumables in your suit. So if there's ability to plug in, recharge your oxygen, your battery, uh, remove carbon dioxide some way, provide uh, a energy source and food and water, they felt that they could actually stay out on the surface for much longer than they did. It was really the suit that limited their activity. It was not so much that they were working so hard that they would just have to stop. And then there was an issue about the lunar module hatch size. Now, I'm pretty confident this would not apply for future uh, missions, but it was really important to note that back in Apollo, when you talked about requirement development for the vehicle, the folks who were designing the lunar module hatch and the people who were de designing the spacesuit and the portable life support pack, at some point, the requirement developers did not interface or interact. So when changes to one were made, they weren't necessarily reporting it to the other teams, and in the end, they had a uh, potentially serious problem with, uh, with that interface. And this gets to this chart here, where if you look at it closely, you see graphed out an example of a lunar astronaut's heart rate, their metabolic rate in BTUs per hour, um, which is basically a reflection of, of exertion level. And then it's plotted against activities on the surface. And when you look at this, you see that for the most part, the crews burn anywhere from six to 900 BTUs per hour, which is in the ballpark of what actually our crews do on ISS, translating along the arm, although it tend to be a little bit higher, which you would expect because they were using their legs, unlike uh, microgravity EVA. One thing I thought that was very interesting and caught my attention was if you look at the very right side of that graph, the heart rates and the met rates are at their highest. And what was going on as far as the mission? They actually were 
climbing the ladder, ingressing the hatch of the lunar module. And I thought to myself, why are they using uh, the most energy and expending the most effort to actually be able to get back in the vehicle? And, and I thought maybe it was because they were deconditioned, they were just tired or something along those lines. When I talked to them, they said that actually the issue associated with that was when they got to the top of the ladder, that was about five and a half feet tall, it wasn't so much the ladder as much as at the very top of that ladder, the hatch was too small to get into. So they really had to manipulate their body to get that portable life support backpack to be able to get in there. And the natural way they wanted to ingress the vehicle was to actually grab up, grab the top, almost like a rail, and try to pull their legs in. But at the top of that, inside the vehicle, was this device called the disc key, the display keyboard. And it was basically the computer that they would uh, plug in their coordinates for the command module that was orbiting around them. And if they damaged that, they were stuck on the moon. They weren't getting back. So they couldn't try to ingress the vehicle that made the most sense. So they kind of had to do twister movements to be able to contort their bodies to actually get in the vehicle um, to get in. So the, the point with that is, you know, human system integration is so important. And we really did that well with Constellation, making sure that if we changed a requirement on the suit or the vehicle or the human side, that the teams were talking and integrating with each other so that the right hand always knew what the left hand was doing. That was a really important lesson learned from that. As far as in-flight medical injuries or illnesses, uh, there's not a lot of difference with the exception of the dust issues than what we see on our ISS crews now or our shuttle crews. Uh, low back pain being one of the more common things. We know a lot more about what we call space adaptation back pain today than we did back then, that it affects about uh, two and three crew members. And typically symptoms are relieved by kind of getting in a curved fetal position. Uh, that would usually relieve it, It'd be present for a couple days afterwards. But we've had up to 10 to 13% of astronauts describe this initial back pain in microgravity as severe. So imagine having you know, severe low back pain, you know, an hour or two after you get into space, that's pretty remarkable. Why it happens, we're not really sure, but crew members elongate two to six centimeters naturally because they lose the curve of their low back when they get into space. It's very interesting when I asked the Apollo astronauts when they got to the lunar surface if they had any uh, recrudescence of back pain that like they did when they first got into space, they said no. And then when they got back into microgravity from the lunar surface, they said that they didn't have any real recurrence. So this seems to suggest that it was really a dynamic transition from 1G to microgravity, but didn't really seem to exacerbate any issues on the lunar surface, which is important for the future, future flight surgeons as far as what you're going to need to prepare in your medical kits, uh, in your training, et cetera, et cetera. The second most common thing was probably the nasal congestion, both introduction into microgravity and then on the lunar surface. It's ubiquitous. Almost all crew will get some nasal congestion. A lot of the reasons why are related to the dryness of the atmosphere. Uh, in Apollo, they had 100% oxygen environment in 5 PSI, an environment that uh, is extremely dry and irritating to the uh, nasal and respiratory mucosa uh, versus today. Today's conditions are uh, sea level conditions, 14.7 PSI and 21% oxygen with about 30 to 40% humidity. Consequently, because of that, the lunar crews used a lot of Actifed, which is kind of an antihistamine, which could make them drowsy and really dry them up. When you're weightless, nothing drains. Your nose, your sinuses stay stopped up. You feel terrible. That's why Actifed cold tablets are standard equipment for every astronaut. They would also use Afrin to try to reduce the nasal congestion, but for packaging reasons, the Afrin in Apollo 7 through 13 actually had basically exploded in the kit, and by the time the crew went to use it on orbit, uh, it, was, it was all spread all over the kit. They couldn't use it. They had to figure out a different way to package uh, the, uh, the spray. Um, and then there was a few issues with cardiac dysrhythmias. What does that mean? That means that there was actually abnormal heartbeats in the Apollo astronauts, and at the time, they thought it was actually due to um, the crew being somewhat dehydrated and being low on certain electrolytes, but it actually was found later on to actually be undetected coronary artery disease. Again, go back to 1968, 69, 70, we didn't have an ability to detect heart disease uh, then as we do today. So for today, most of our astronauts, when they go to space, have less than a 1% likelihood of having a cardiac disease-related cardiac dysrhythmia, but back then they didn't. And this was an issue on the lunar surface where the flight surgeon was on console and saw this crew member having all this 
this uh, cardiac irritability, and they really didn't know what it was. Dehydration has always been an issue because the crews just don't drink enough in this dry environment, so the flight surgeon is constantly encouraging the crews to drink enough, but certainly they felt that back in Apollo that the uh, heart irritability was related to dehydration. Some of the recommendations that the crews gave us were that um, uh, not only should you have a good pre- and in-flight um, core strengthening program, but also in their, their couches where they slept, their seats, they had a, basically a sleeping bag that they would sleep in and they want to be able to draw both their knees up to their chest to kind of create that fetal position, but they couldn't in the sleeping bag. So they basically slept out of the sleeping bag, but then on the lunar surface it would get really, really cold. So they were constantly having disrupted sleep because of that. So one of the recommendations was, you know, try to provide a sleeping bag that allows you to bring both knees up to your chest. And this occurs up until this day. My crews that go up to the space station, they try to bring their knees to their chest those first couple of days to relieve that back pain. And that's a simple fix. Don't strap your feet down. Constipation was an issue and it had to do for a lot of different reasons, dehydration being one of them. The type of food sources, very low residue, high calorie foods, just for a packaging standpoint. Uh, this has generally been solved uh, for the most part with our crews today, so I don't anticipate that being an issue. I described the lunar dust association with upper respiratory symptoms. And then the last issue on this slide was musculoskeletal injuries on the lunar surface. There was an injury that occurred in an astronaut where they injured their shoulder, and uh, that had the potential, if this crew member were required to do multiple EVAs over, let's say, the next couple of weeks, that this injury resulted in so much pain that it really could have been a problem. This is a video, um, actually, of Harrison Schmidt at Taurus Littrow on Apollo 17 that just shows you how much uh, falls in the lunar surface were an issue. And from a standpoint of you know, knees and ankles and hips and wrists and elbows, you know, what is it that we had to know that uh, we could do to prevent future injuries? The interesting feedback I got from the crew when I watched this video was that actually in 1-6-G, they had time to react. Um, and they really weren't concerned about knee or hip injuries. Wrist injuries were a concern, but that was more from the fact that with that uh, helmet visibility, as I mentioned earlier, they couldn't see their outstretched hand. So imagine falling and you can't see your outstretched hand, the position of your hand relative to the ground, you could definitely injure your wrist. And that was something that got back to improving the visibility of, of the helmet, improving the um, mobility of the suit to really not impact um, uh, the crew adversely. But as far as the ankle, the knee, the hip, the low back, they really weren't as concerned that there would be um, muscular injuries from the standpoint of falls. It was interesting. I didn't really believe what the Apollo astronauts were telling me about this. So in my stubbornness, uh, the week after this meeting, I did a, 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 a what we call the vomit comet flight, the parabolic flight, where you do these parabolas, and we were doing lunar parabolas and I would try to push off the side of the aircraft to actually get hurt. I mean, that's what a flight surgeon does. Uh, recreate the environment that causes injury. And uh, it was just like the Apollo astronaut said, you know, I could not get hurt because I had time to react to catch myself with that very, that very, very uh, kind uh, gravitational vector. It wasn't like one third G, a Martian um, uh, parabola, where a one third G is a much more like 1G than the 1.6G. 1.6G seemed to be the best of all worlds, and the, the Apollo crew certainly reiterated that they really love being on the lunar surface. As far as the medications in the kit, there really weren't a lot of recommendations here, and I think we've incorporated a lot of their recommendations into the space shuttle and certainly into the space station. But again, in, sh in your return lunar programs in Mars, you're probably gonna have very limited kit size, so you really gotta research what medications, what equipment you're gonna use, make sure it has multiple uses, and that you take you know, the right amount for this stuff. The crews really didn't use a lot of medication aside for, again, the, the ActiFed for the nasal congestion, the Afrin, uh, um, uh, ibuprofen or aspirin equivalent, and then they would use medications for, uh, for sleep. And the medications they used for sleep back then were uh, forms of barbiturates, which are awful. Today, we have much, much better medications for sleep. They did recommend strongly that you have some type of saline eye drop, again, because of the dust getting in their eyes was very, very irritating, and also something to keep the nasal mucosa uh, very moist, so some type of saline eye drop, and include this in your individual medical accessory kit, the IMAC contents. Um, again, also have analgesia, ibuprofen, uh, 
or acetaminophen for the space adaptation headaches, any kind of musculoskeletal injuries. And then I, the last uh, line is about the impact of no PMC. PMC is doctor talk for private medical conference. Today, I get 15 minutes each week with my crew to have a scheduled private medical conference where it's just me and my crew. Um, if I need to have an unscheduled PMC for whatever reason, I can always do that as well. During Apollo, they didn't have the ability to have a private space to ground loop. So if the Apollo astronaut needed to talk to their flight surgeon, they had to do it over the open comm in the mission operation control room and everyone heard about it. And it was pretty notorious that if an astronaut was saying they were constipating and they couldn't poop, the next day it was in the Houston Chronicle, you know, so-and-so can't poop. I mean, they just didn't want that kind of publicity. So then they often just kept things from the flight surgeon. Um, so conditions would come back to, to Earth and unbeknownst to the flight surgeon, these things had gone on, but it was just a matter of privacy. We fixed all those problems for the most part and we don't have issues with that today, but it's very important. This is really kind of an eye chart, but it breaks down for those of you who are interested in using um, kit sizes, configuring kits, dimensions of kits, and then for those of you who work in the biomedical or medical field, the kind of medications that they had back in the Apollo kits. It's more of just for a historical record, but again, the most common medications were the, uh, the analgesics. Um, we did stock antibiotics, but we never needed to use them. Band-Aids, gauze, again, the nasal sprays, ways to lubricate the eyes, et cetera, et cetera. There was a myriad of drugs that were in there, as you can see, that were never touched. Uh, the majority of them, uh, including cardiac medication and other things, were never used. Why is that? And to this day, this is very true, in the screening before crews go to space, we screen out most disease. So I don't need to fly you know, a pharmacy full of drugs for crews, and even back to Apollo with their limited screening. These are extraordinarily healthy, fit individuals. So you really didn't have to have a lot of medications or things, but you still had to think about the what ifs. And that's the thing that you know, is you're in a rock and a hard place when you're talking about mass and volume, is you know, how much should I bring of what and what should that be? This, this chart again reflects at least the thinking back in Apollo. As far as the in-flight monitoring, what did they actually measure? What did they look, look for in the, um, the Apollo astronauts' uh, vital signs, if you will? Uh, the one thing they did do back then was they did continuous monitoring of the heart rate via a two-lead ECG monitor. Uh, they would also measure blood pressure. They would measure their respiratory rate through an impedance pneumograph and then body temperature. The two photos um, show a crew member with the attachments of the biomedical harness and then the picture where the crew member has raised his left arm up, you see this kind of uh, red area, kind of in a circular pattern, it was actually a staph infection of the skin that the crews frequently would get because of the, the paste that they would use under the electrodes, and it would actually be somewhat infective. I mean, it would resolve on its own, and they didn't need to use medications for it, but there was the concern back then that they could get a serious skin infection if they wore these electrodes uh, longer than they really needed to which was at that time during the entire mission. Today, we do not measure uh, vital signs in this way. The only time we measure vital signs is during the spacewalks. When the crew are in their spacesuits, they have these electrodes attached, but otherwise uh, we have pretty good data on the crew's vitals during the entirety of their mission, and we don't monitor this regularly, unless it's clinically indicated. The picture on the right is what the, uh, the MOKER, the Mission Operation Control Room, looked like back in uh, Johnson Space Center. This whole idea that uh, Chris Kress came up with the, the trench idea is actually how those consoles were arranged and the flight surgeon was in the middle of that as well, monitoring this biomedical information real time um, from their console. Very interesting, when we turn towards the environmental impacts, um, this probably had some of the most lively uh, discussion from the Apollo crew, and it was built in part by the research that I did when I would go through the logs and see how often they commented about the um, encumbrances of the waste management system, specifically the device that collected urine from these male crew members uh, sometimes leaked, and then the, um, the fact that they didn't actually have a toilet in Apollo. They actually had to use a bag, which I'll talk about more. The importance of having basic human capabilities, the ability to squat, the ability to control odor, and the ability to suck things away from your body. I mean, it sounds kind of disgusting, but I think we're really taking gr for granted um, because of, again, mass, power, volume, size, you know, saving, not having a toilet versus a bag seemed to make a lot of sense to engineering. But this particular area came up time and time again 
with the engineering teams with the future vehicles about saving space, saving weight by just going back to this Apollo system. And I can tell you, if you take nothing else from this briefing, it didn't work. It did not work. Some of the Apollo astronauts years later have said, oh, it wasn't that bad a system. I have their live transcript recordings of how bad the system was. John Yen said it was the bane of the Apollo missions. Uh, the crews would intentionally use medication to cause constipation to prevent them from having to use the waste management system because it was so onerous and they had no way to control odor. So I think enough of it's explained, you get the idea, but um, it affected their appetite. It affected a lot of things that they did. And if you're gonna talk about improving crew health and performance, having a toilet, having a waste management system that actually takes care of basic human functions is very, very important. Do not take that for granted. Even if they're short duration missions, Everyone's got to poop and pee at some point. Enough said. As far as the potable water system, back then they used uh, chlorine, uh, basically bleach, in the water systems, but because of an inability to really mix the water systems very good, uh, they would often get a mouthful of uh, chlorine tainted water, and this affected their ability to you know, really drink a lot of water because it just tasted awful. They would mix in tang, <laughs> and they would have chlorine flavored tang or a bleach flavored orange drink or something like that. We've got a much better way of purifying our systems today. So again, this system, again, has not been an issue, but again, water is a necessary human um, consumable. You've got to have this. You've got to ensure that it's not contaminated, that it's tastes good, et cetera, et cetera. Noise was a fairly big issue as it is today, but we had noise abatement systems that the crews would use, earplugs. They don't have the sophisticated headphone, noise attending headphones that we have today. But on the ISS, our audiology teams work very hard to protect crew hearing because it is a very loud uh, environment. The thermal environment, temperature, was also an issue on one of the Apollo missions, specifically Apollo 13, when they lost uh, their ability to have uh, um, electricity, they shut down all their heating systems and the cabins got extremely cold. On the ISS today, the uh, thermal system is 71 to 72 degrees, very constant, usually very, very comfortable, and it hasn't been much of an issue. But again, thermal for, for Apollo uh, certainly had um, its moments. And when the crew was on the lunar surface, they said that the floor of the lunar module got extremely cold. Again, if you think about the environment they were in, I mean, it could have been minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that was a very cold environment, and you had to think of ways to keep the crews warm. The carbon dioxide levels on spacecraft are about 10 times the level that they are on Earth because air movement is totally dependent on ventilation. On Earth right now, I'm spewing out carbon dioxide with every exhalation because of Brownian motion in the molecules in the air. It's all dissipated. It's not an issue. In space, you don't have that. So if I don't have a vent right by my face, that carbon dioxide will build up. And over time, with multiple crew members in a small environment, carbon dioxide would start to go up and it manifests as headaches, drowsiness, what we can call space fog, irritability, a lot of different things. So carbon, carbon dioxide scrubbing capability and the ability to monitor is very, very important. Uh, a couple of the astronauts said that uh, radio frequency identification tags for stowage would markedly improve uh, stowage. And to this day, our crews on orbit have a really hard time keeping track of things if it's not tagged with, uh, with RFID. So that's something for stowage. Make sure you have because your area can get very cluttered quickly and uh, finding stuff, especially in emergency, can be very difficult. So this was something they offered up as well and we actually use today. Um, the design phases, it was critical that the astronauts were involved throughout every single phase. And they just emphasized that point going back to the Apollo 1 fire and things that uh, were skipped over or missed or taken for granted. Uh, they made sure when they came back for Apollo 7 that astronauts were involved in every single detail to make sure that things were checked. As far as hot water in the galley, uh, they had lukewarm to, to warm water, but they didn't really have hot water. And the crews really wanted to have hot coffee or the ability to do a hot shave or something like that. If there was a way to harness heat from your avionics, your electronics, to heat water so they could have it for drinks or whatever would be very important. Don't take hot water for granted either or cold water. I've got a picture here. This is actually the urine collection device. It was basically a condom catheter that when you needed to use it, you'd slip your parts in, you would fill the bag up and then you would attach it to a device and as you would coordinate with suction, would draw the urine out of the vehicle 
and to spell it into space. Now we have collection bags and we actually reclaim our urine into a water reclamation system to have uh, our potable water from our urine. This was the Apollo bag. So this was the bag that if you could figure out where your uh, bottom was at, that you would try to coordinate as fixing the top of that aperture to your butt and then bear down and try to poop in it and hope the poop actually went into that bag. And oftentimes it didn't. Again, use your imagination, enough said, uh, toilets are good. Okay, as far as radiation went, uh, again, based on the technology uh, that they had back in 69 through 72, there's a lot of assumptions made about solar flares, solar energy, different things that would happen and the time that the crews would have to get to a safe haven. Uh, we know today, based on improved technology, that the transit time for charged particles is much, much, much shorter and it could potentially be of much longer duration than it was during Apollo. So you really need to work out a much better uh, surface contingency plan in the event that there was a solar storm because there is no geomagnetosphere on the moon to protect you from charged particles. Um, one of the recommendations they had uh, for Apollo, for future crews, is to have a way to do active radiation disseminated. In other words, have a uh, disseminator on the crew member that could actually actively real-time measure radiation exposure for the tissues. Today, we actually have passive radiation disseminators. All the crews wear this throughout their entire mission, and when they come back, the radiation teams can analyze it, and then we know what the crew's radiation exposure was for their entire mission, but that's after the fact, after the mission. If there was a solar storm, I would want to know as the flight surgeon what radiation dose my crew is exposed to because, because depending on that, I might need to use something like a radio protectant, some way to combat free radical uh, generation or something that, that could make the, the astronauts ill. Uh, one of the strong recommendations was the rover that you develop for, for these future missions should have some way to shield the crew and the equipment, which is equally sensitive to radiation, so you're not constantly in threat of, of uh, being affected by you know something that you have no control over, a solar storm. Uh, the plan that the crew actually had was that in the event that they were told that they had a coronal mass ejection, a solar flare, that they would try to dig at least a meter deep hole in the lunar surface, get the commander and the lunar module pilot in there, bury themselves with the lunar dirt, and try to wait the event out. Again, a lot of assumptions were made based on what they thought was the transit time of the charged particles, the duration of the event, et cetera, et cetera. And now we know today that would have basically kill them because those events can last 24 hours. The doses can be much higher. Uh, there's pretty good evidence from modeling and other things that the crew would actually never sustain a radiation event in the suit that would kill them in the suit, but they could get radiation sickness over the course of a couple of weeks or something like that. So again, very different based on the technology, but shielding either in your vehicle and or your habitat to protect the crew in an environment where you have no um, magnetosphere to protect them from charged particles was going to be really, really important. The behavioral health and performance section probably had some of the liveliest debate. Uh, crews brought out stories from their missions that some of their fellow crew members had never even heard, and it was actually really enlightening to hear the crew talk about the pre-flight quarantine, sleep, medications, their work rest cycles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of the recommend recommendations that had given us was for example, in quarantine, they felt that they were constantly having to study, review things, they were having trainers always trying to train them, and that they often launched tired versus um, the way we do missions now in Russia with the uh, ISS astronauts where we have weeks in quarantine, the crews are doing a little bit of training, but they're pretty well rested when they get up there. Uh, so that was one recommendation they gave is try to give the crew a break before they launch um, uh, so they, they actually have uh, you know, sufficient uh, energy for the transition. Sleep was fitful for the Apollo crews. They had uh, very old medications that tend to cause, that had very long half-lives, tend to be very gro groggy, and they just didn't sleep well. On a lunar surface, they were encouraged to try to sleep, but the attitude was, hey, I'm on the moon, I'm not sleeping, I'm gonna stay awake and do what I gotta do, because I ain't never coming back here. So again, you can do that for a day or two, but we clearly have seen decrements in performance and health if you go more than three days with less than four hours of sleep of night, uh, sleep at night. Uh, so you definitely want to make sure that they have clean medications. What I mean by that is medications that don't have a hangover effect, that aren't drowsy. And in the event that while you're asleep with these medications on board, if there's an emergency that you can wake up and you can function and think 
without being so impaired. Uh, we're much better today than we were back then, but that was certainly an issue for Apollo. As far as work rest cycles go, again, crews were on the surface the longest three days, and they felt they could really just power through uh, doing lots of work, lots of, lots of science and things. But for longer durations on the stays, they really advocated, uh, really advocated maybe working three days, have a day off, working four days, have a day off, and, and make that manageable for the crew so they could really re kind of recharge themselves. They might be doing in, you know, in suit maintenance on the vehicle or, or doing something uh, as far as preparing for science, but at least give them a day off just to let their brain kind of reboot. As far as the authority structure, this was an interesting point. What I mean by this is that the crews felt very strongly that uh, the commander of the Apollo mission would never fail. And there were instances, I won't go into details, where uh, because of fatigue or other issues, the commander may have been prone to uh, miscalling something or whatever. The other crew members would make sure that that commander never failed. So they would do whatever they could to make sure that they built up their commander. And this really came from the fact that with the exception of Harrison Schmidt, uh, the Apollo crew members were all military, for, or former military members. And that uh, that's kind of our military style. Uh, we make sure we build up our commander and, and do everything we can to make sure that they succeed. Because if they're succeeding, then the mission's succeeding. And that was an attitude that really came out during that session. Crew was very vocal about the lack of crew family support back then. Um, they felt that uh, the, the family really were put on pedestals and that when they were having issues, uh, they weren't getting adequate resources. Uh, much to everyone's um, joy today, our behavioral health performance teams take fantastic care of the spouses, the children, extended family for the duration of these missions. And they have to because our astronauts are on uh, the space station for six months. So we spent a lot of time before, in, and afterwards making sure that all the family's needs are met, that they have weekly uh, high-definition video conferences with their crew member, that their crew member can call them and talk to them if there's any issues going on, and that their flight surgeon is intimately involved with trying to make sure that the family's taken care of uh, to relieve the crew member's uh, um, anxiety. It wasn't like that back then, and we've worked those problems out, and we've come a long way with that. As far as countermeasures for mental fatigue, again, this really referred more towards um, the, the transits. Uh, when you left low Earth orbit on your way to the moon, translunar coast, or on the way back, there was just hours of downtime. There's really nothing going on in the vehicle. There's nothing really to do, and the crews wanted things to kind of keep their brains sharp. Uh, one thing was exercise, but there are other things that they would recommend implementing just to keep your brain working so you were always sharp in the event that an emergency happened. You didn't want to kind of get lulled into just these phases where things just apparently were not, you know, very dynamic. And um, we don't want things to go wrong, but certainly things to, whether it's electronic devices for music or video or something like that. And these are things we've incorporated into uh, caring for our ISS astronauts, again, for basically just mental health. And it's worked really well. Exercise is interesting because on our current exercise suites in uh, the International Space Station, we have very robust resistive exercise devices called the A-RED, a treadmill that can get you up to about 12 miles an hour attached to a bungee cord system, and a cycle ergometer, a cycle that can impart almost 350 watts of, uh, of um, resistance. Apollo had something called the Extra Genie. It was basically a canister with a flywheel that you can turn in uh, resistance, two ropes, and you would basically just do this. You'd attach one end of the, the device to a strut, and then you would just do this. And the crew used it a lot. They wanted to exercise. They wanted to get their heart rate up. They wanted to sweat. And they wanted to feel like they could be in as much shape as possible. But that really took up some space. So it was really limited. And the problem with Apollo, too, was they were in a 100% oxygen environment. And this canister with you know continuous use would get very, very hot. And they were concerned, again, in the wake of Apollo 1, that anything that could get hot or potentially be a source of ignition in a 100% oxygen environment could be really, really dangerous. So they had limited use of the Apollo Extra Genie, but again, the crew was adamant that they have a really robust exercise device to keep them in shape for contingencies, for spacewalks, for return uh, to the Earth, and then also just for rest and relaxation. It was, it was a great distraction uh, to, um, to just be able to get out there and exercise, break a little sweat and feel pretty good. One thing at the bottom of this chart that I thought was very interesting was the comment about an upper body strengthening program. Um, it was serendipitous 
that uh, one of the commanders had actually done a really uh, robust upper body strengthening program on his own before he went to the moon. But he found when he got to the moon that the 1-6-G actually kind of worked against you in terms of when you're trying to do drilling experiments or anything that demanded you push into the lunar surface uh, because you didn't have 1-G, you had 1-6-G. So it, the power to do that really came from the crew member's upper body. And again, going back to the limitations of the mobility in the suit, anything you could do to maintain chest, arm, forearm strength to allow you to do surface activity was really, really important. And something that you know, was really not really appreciated until he came back and said, you know, we really need to do something to make sure that the upper body is strong. Uh, we always focus on the lower extremities and long duration space fight because of the loss of bone and muscle. Uh, and the, the upper body doesn't really undergo a lot of loss because the crew is using their upper bodies to m get around and stuff. But they're not doing things like they did on the lunar surface where they really had to do a lot of mechanical work and again relied on their upper body strength. So this is an important point for them. As far as the recovery asset deployment area, most of the recovery was in the uh, South Pacific uh, Ocean. The range could be pretty wide, uh, but for the most part, the uh, recovery teams, the aircraft carrier, uh, the frogmen, the, the future Navy SEAL teams that were at recovery were no more than about uh, 88 minutes out from landing, and typically it was within about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, again, with a very primordial tracking system, they did a fantastic job at pinpointing in a very, very large ocean where these crews would uh, end up um, landing and then be able to get to them very, very quickly, get them out of the vehicle, and then for the first couple of missions, put them in quarantine to make sure that any space bugs that they brought back weren't uh, communicated to the uh, recovery teams. Apollo 7 through 10 served kind of as a dress rehearsal for these quarantine procedures. They would do quarantine before and then quarantine afterwards to try to kind of simulate what it was going to be like, but the true quarantine didn't begin until Apollo 11. Um, they kept them in quarantine for 21 days for Apollo 11 through 14 because they really didn't know what kind of uh, diseases they might bring back from the lunar surface. At the end of Apollo 14, nothing had grown out of their blood, out of their sputum, out of all the body samples that they did, uh, didn't grow out of any suits or anything else that they brought back, and they deemed that uh, there was really no contagion. And uh, for Apollo 15, 16, and 17, the crews did not have to do a, a post-flight quarantine beyond just the normal uh, biomedical um, assessments that they would do. As far as the testing that they did pre- and post-flight, it was typically done in quarantine or on the aircraft carrier by the JSC flight surgeon, and then you had specialists in each of these areas who would actually do a heart exam. Then you have an ophthalmologist in the eye exam, and a neurologist would come and do a full neurologic exam, ear, nose, throat would do the upper respiratory, and then you have neuropsychiatry. Today, the NASA flight surgeon does all these jobs. If there's a need for a specialty doctor to intervene, they will intervene, but this is all done by the NASA flight surgeon. Some of the recommendations the crews uh, gave as far as launch, uh, landing, and recovery ops was that the crew surgeon should be available on the recovery vessel and at all phases. That was one thing they felt really important. Why was that? The crew surgeon is generally with the crew the whole, uh, through all the mission phases, at least today they are, and they know the crew better than anyone else. And that's the person that they want next to them when they come back in the event that there's any problem or anything like that. They want to have the person they trust the most right there with them. So that was where that comment came from. The recommendation to provide adequate cooling, we've learned, is really, really important. Um, these crews are going to be seasick. Uh, they're going to be very neurovestibular challenged. And a warm environment just provocates that seasickness and, and feeling really bad. So it's really important for the new vehicles that engineers engineer in a way to accurately cool crews and keep them very, very comfortable to mitigate some of the risk for nausea and vomiting and weakness. Uh, the water landings uh, will provoke seasickness. Uh, with a few exceptions, all the NASA uh, or the Apollo uh, astronauts were uh, naval aviators, very used to water operations, and yet most all of them got sick because, again, after that time in space where your nervous vestibular system is offloaded, uh, a very provocative uh, sea state can, can, can trigger nausea and vomiting, and it did. Uh, sea states less than six to eight foot swells they felt would be tolerable. Uh, but greater than that would really make a mess of the crew, especially if they had to do contingency operations. And this should built into requirements too, as far as recovery. Uh, they felt that the Apollo C configurations for the water landings were adequate. Um, they often didn't have fresh food or water for the recoveries that were a little bit longer. Again, I think the longest one was 88 minutes. So they want to make sure that 
uh, they have fresh water and food, especially if they've been vomiting, it's said they want to be able to have some water. And then again, the cooling is key. This picture of the Apollo 15 landing is really interesting because if you look at it, you see that one of the chutes didn't deploy. Uh, one shoot out is a survivable event, but it's a hard landing. Two shoots out would be not would be an unsurvivable event. Um, so just thinking about your landing recovery operations, how this impacts the crews. They're landing on their back for the most part, but it's very dynamic. So when the, the vehicle hits that water, it's going to tip, roll. It could be in a stable one, stable two uh, state where it's upside down under the water uh, and then should upright itself when the bag's deployed. But if it doesn't, the crews are trained and expected to actually deploy the hatch and then be able to swim out. Again, imagine doing that after you've been in space. The crews need to be in good physical condition and not be so nervous to be really challenged that they just cannot uh, perform an emergency procedure. Again, they encouraged uh, the flight surgeon of the future to act as more of an advocate of the crew than they did back uh, then. The, rock, the Apollo flight surgeon were kind of in a rock and a hard place. There's so much unknown about what the crews going to the moon were going to experience that they had to satisfy the requirements and the, the needs of NASA and at the same time try to make sure that they're taking care of the crew and the flight students often got stuck in between the two whereas today uh, the, the NASA flight student is, is the prime advocate for their crew um, as opposed back then. Uh, the comment that the current astronaut crew surgeon relationship after they learned about what we do they felt was excellent and should be definitely an example for future generations. In this picture here you see the Apollo 11 crew getting off the vehicle in their uh, isolation containment suits off the the, air, uh, the helicopter before they transferred to the airstream and the WFP is the term that was given to Dr. Bill Carpentier, world famous physician. He was so beloved by his Apollo crew when they went on their 40-day world trip after the Apollo 11 mission, they would often be giving eight-hour interviews and speeches around the world. They would get so tired, they would actually just put Bill, Dr. Carpentier, in that role to actually answer all the questions and take care of him. They had that much trust in their flight surgeon uh, that they um, uh, empowered him to actually do that job for him. And that's kind of the relationship that uh, the, the flight docs of today really work to have with their crews. Um, to just have that kind of trust and uh, camaraderie. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, we've published uh, several uh, articles and a technical manual that goes into detail about everything that I've talked about. If you're interested in really following up for more details, the Apollo Medical Operations Project recommendations for, to improve health and performance uh, for future exploration crews. That's a technical manual that's publicly available. Uh, that you can get. On the right side is a paper that we published in Acta Astronautica. That's basically a summary of the, the Apollo Medical Operations Project. It's a much easier read, less painful. Uh, that really just jumps right to the recommendations in that recommendations chart and then how we disposition these into requirements. Out of all the recommendations, we had 107 that were offered up from the Apollo crews for future requirements. And I think in the final disposition, we ended up incorporating maybe about a third of those recommendations into requirements somewhere in the phase of uh, new vehicle development, suit development, crew uh, activity, flight plans, et cetera, et cetera. So this project and the centralized database were enormously successful, but really probably the major success was the relationship we developed with Apollo to this day where we could go back at any point and just pick their brains on things that, that would come along uh, really um, uh, made sure that their legacy continued to live and would serve future exploration uh, uh, crews, uh, engineers, and their flight service. So, thank you. <laughs>